These are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Thank you for coming to this month's Kaufman Authors Series discussion. We are absolutely pleased to welcome Megan McCardle as our author this month. Megan is the author of The Upside of Down, Why Failing Well is the Key to Success. Bloomberg columnist and blogger Megan McCardle makes the case that success in business and in life is largely contingent on how quickly and nimbly we learn from our mistakes. One of the most popular business and economics bloggers for more than a decade, the Colonel challenges us to think differently about how we live and how we work. Megan, thank you for being here. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so I guess I was, this is the first time I've done a webinar, so uh, hopefully I will fail creatively if I fail. Um, and I'm just going to start talking about you know this book that I've written, what I learned about failure, and you know how we can do it better because that's the big challenge. Is that I love those movies where they always say failure is not an option, and that's just a lie. Failure is always an option, right? You may not want it to be, but it's out there. Um, and in fact, it's a very powerful option. It's a way that we learn and grow and try new things we've never done before. Um, but it's not an option we like. You know, there's a great uh, Woody Allen quote where he says, I don't want to achieve immortality by, uh, through my work, I want to achieve it by not dying. And we often feel the same way about failure, which is that we don't want to achieve success by failing. We want to achieve it by not failing. Um, unfortunately, that's not really possible. So how do we... How do we, first of all, recognize this is the case, and second of all, how do, we, how do we actually master that in our lives and as voters and citizens and members of corporations? Um, so the, uh, you know, th there's a great test done by Peter Skillman. He used to be the head of UI for Palm, which some of you may remember was the inventor of the handheld device before the iPhone came along. And he did this great group exercise called the Marshmallow Challenge. Um, it's a, a lot of you may have done it on team building exercises. I did a version of it when I went to business school. And so basically he gives people a bunch of spaghetti, gives them some scotch tape, and he gives them a marshmallow. And he tells each, he divides them into group, and he tells each group, build me the tallest thing that is capable of supporting a marshmallow. And so, you know, some of the results aren't that surprising. Singaporean engineers do very well in this test. Um, some of the groups who don't do well, also not that surprising. MBAs do not do very well in this, this test. Apparently they spend way too much time arguing about like who's gonna get to write the Spaghetti Inc. vision statement instead of actually building. Um, but the group that did best is a bit of a surprise. Kindergartners. Kindergartners are great at this challenge. And why? So you look at these things, you look at the, the things that the Singaporean engineers built and they're like the Eiffel Tower. But you look at the things the kindergartners built and they look kind of like modern art. Um, so how come they're so successful? Well, the first thing is the kindergartners don't know that there are any rules because they're in kindergarten, right? They're still struggling with that. And so they're the only group that asks for more spaghetti. Um, but the second reason that they do so well is it's what they do with that spaghetti, is that they use it to iterate and experiment. They build something, if it doesn't work, they take it apart and they, they try again. And they do that fast, 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 fast. This is what Silicon Valley calls failing fast to succeed. This is a crucial concept. If you, you know, as Skillman says, if you want to succeed fast, you need to fail fast. You need to be prepared to try things and then see what works and then ruthlessly kill what doesn't. Experiment, iteration, and discarding your failures, it's the most powerful force in the universe, seriously. If you think about what are the, the major, what's the reason that you are living in a nice house with air conditioning and heating and, and so forth and you're not living in a little mud hut somewhere? Um, fundamentally, this is due to three things. I mean, the first is evolution, right? Evolution basically gave you a huge brain, it gave you fingers that can manipulate things, it gave human, hum, the human race these things. Um, and evolution is not a planning process. It's just, so, you know, variation and selection. There's a mutation. Usually those mutations are fatal. If they're not fatal, usually they don't do you any good um, and are actively harmful. But the few things that help you be more adaptive to your environment, nature selects for those things, and you end up with 
giant brain compared to other primates and five fingers and all sorts of walking upright, all sorts of useful adaptations. That's just the process of, hey, mutation, is this good or bad in the environment that it's in? Second thing that relies on failure markets. This is what Joseph Schumpeter calls creative disruption. Um, basically, you know, new ideas come along, new firms come along, new industries come along, and they sweep away what is old, and they replace them with something that's better, uh, makes us more prosperous. That is basically why America is so rich, is that process of creative destruction, allowing the Western developed world, and increasingly, thankfully, the developing world now, um, to replace the old folk ways that we've had for thousands of years, in some cases longer than that, um, with a much more comfortable, longer, uh, more luxurious life. And the third thing is science, right? And, and that goes hand in hand with markets. Is why do why is it that you know Nathan Rothschild could die of of easily cured diseases? Calvin Coolidge's son died of an abscessed uh, blister that he got playing tennis. He was young, he was in his twenties, and he died of this because there were no antibiotics in the twenties. Um, how does science work? We think of it as like brilliant science, scientist has idea and goes forward and finally figures out idea is correct. But in fact, if you, if you talk to scientists, a lot of, most of what they do, the most powerful thing that they do is they test their hypothesis. And usually those tests fail. Usually those tests say your hypothesis is wrong. And that's actually incredibly powerful because that, you know, the universe is incredibly complicated. A realistic model of the universe is the universe. Once you're dealing with anything smaller than that, you have to make a model, which means that you may have missed something. And that, in turn, means that the only way that you can be sure is to try something and see whether it works or not. So the problem is we, we hate that. <laughs> and yet, after it's happened, we don't feel that way. So if you ask people, what's the best thing that ever happened to me? You get these incredible answers. You get divorce, <laughs> my husband's affair, cancer, getting pregnant. These are all answers that I got out of a survey that I ran in, in 2012. Why is this? So let's go back to creative destruction, because this is not just true in business. It's also true in our personal lives, is that freedom really is just another word for nothing left to lose. So what does failure do? And I, I go back to my own example, which I, I talk about in the book, is that in 2001, I graduated from business school. I had a job lined up at a big management consulting firm. I was going to have a six-figure salary. This was why I'd gone to business school, was to have a good, reliable job. I mean, I'd gotten this job in October of my second year of school. And that's really what business school is about for a lot of people. It's going there and, and having easy access to recruiting and getting a good job. Well, that management consulting firm laid off my whole associate class, and that left me in a bit of a bind. And I actually spent two years doing various things. I worked for a year at Ground Zero, as anyone who's ever, as anyone who's a long-time reader of mine knows. Um, I did some consulting, I did some freelance journalism, I started a blog. Um, and in 2003, I was getting really desperate. And that was the point at which The Economist offered me a job as a journalist. I was thrilled. I mean, because in that time, I had started writing an economics blog and realized that what I really loved more than anything I'd ever done was writing about economics and communicating it to other people. Um, and so when The Economist came along and offered me a job, I, I took the job. I was really excited. It's been an amazing career now, spanning long, more than 10 years um, of writing about economics, getting to interview super smart people and write down what they say. But here's the thing. Um, if, it, if that job had been offered to me two years before, I couldn't have done it, despite the fact that I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was eight. But ever since I've been in college, I've been running away from that. I've been looking for something that was safe and guaranteed. And it was that two years of unemployment, that first job at The Economist paid $40,000 a year. Um, the job I'd been expecting paid three times that. And could I have dared to switch from that job with my, I had $1,000 in loan payments a month to make. It's not an unusual situation for students. Being desperate, having been unemployed, actually led me to consider doing something that I really wanted to do, but I wouldn't have had the courage if I'd had that safe option. And so when you get rid of safe, it's true, it's scary, it's miserable. I'm not downplaying the fact that you should just la 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 your way through unemployment. It's really horrible. It's the worst thing that can happen to you in a, in a developed economy, short of death or dismemberment. But it does create new opportunities because it takes away something that was safe but not great. 
Um, so the problem is we, we struggle to believe that. So you know, here's how we, we think of entrepreneurship, right? Here's how we think about the, the people who do this more than anyone else, right? Is that um, with, you know, with the picture of them, they've got their arms crossed, they're staring boldly out at the future from the cover of a big business magazine. Um, and that is like the dominant way that we think about entrepreneurship in this country. But if you talk to entrepreneurs, it's not quite how they see themselves. <laughs> Right? Entrepreneurs, when you interview them, they describe a lot of struggle. They describe a lot of, you know, we thought that we were going to do this one thing and then it turned out no one wanted to buy that. But in the middle of doing this, we'd invented some other little thing we're using for ourselves and that turned into our main product. Or I started my business because I got laid off. You know, the canonical example of this for me is my boss, Mike Bloomberg, um, he started Bloomberg with his severance from Solomon Brothers. Um, in after the the bloodbath of the 80s, when he was let go, you know, he could have just taken. He had a lot of money. He could have just taken it and gone and lived comfortably, you know, somewhere in in middle America. And instead, he took that money and he sunk it into a company. Um, and in the beginning, you know, it was it was all ad hoc. Everyone all experimental. And that is how most entrepreneurs actually describe their own experience: is this feeling of constant terror because. You know, you don't have any grand plan. You have some ideas, uh, but frequently they don't work. Frequently you have to try something and then kill it when it doesn't, when it turns out not to work. And then, you know, a lot of the time, the fact is that it doesn't work. Is that you've done this thing and it was a really good idea on paper, but it just didn't work out. If you look at the survival rates of companies, this is data. This is data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, what you see is that most companies do not live very long. Um, this doesn't always mean that the company has closed because it just ran out of money. It may be that the founder realized that this wasn't what he wanted to do. It may be that, you know, they, but ultimately, if you look at how many establishments survive even as long as seven years, um, it's a minority. It's really that this is most businesses that are started are going to fail within five years. They are going to shut down within five years, and they're not going to turn out to have been the dream that people wanted. And part of the real challenge that countries have, if they want this innovative, creative destruction, destruction of economy, is that you have to figure out, how do we get people to do this thing that is a little bit crazy? How do we get them to stand at the top of the precipice and look down and say, okay, I'm willing to risk it? Because objectively, it really is it, the odds are not with you. Now the payoff can be great, and so that's one thing that, that, that countries do, is that they offer big rewards to people who take big risks. Um, and that's really important. That's really critical if, if you want people to, to be willing to go out on a limb and get rid of safe, there has to be an upside that they can see that is bigger than what they have now. Um, but that's not the only thing that you have to worry about. We tend to focus too much on that side, on the on that raw cash incentive side, um, and less about the on the cultural and institutional things that we need to do um, in order to get people to be what uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Many of you will probably have seen this quote: "To be the man in the arena." And the first thing that you need to do is that you need to get people focused on the outcome instead of the process. And this is true when you're looking at failure prospectively, you know, as in it might happen, um, and it is also true when you're looking at, at it retrospectively. To see what I mean, you know, so when I, when I was in summer camp, when I was a little kid, we used to have to go swimming at 7 a.m., and the summer camp was in Vermont, and it was very cold at 7 a.m., and so you would get out for this morning swim, and you'd be standing on the dock, and you'd be looking at the lake, and you would know that it was going to be really cold. Um, and it was impossible to make yourself get in because every time you would start, you would think about how cold it was going to be and you would just stand there on the dock. And then what I eventually realized was that the secret to getting yourself off the dock was to stop thinking about the lake. Because if you thought about the lake too much, you were never going to get into it and then your counselor was going to yell at you. What you needed to do was think about the process, the actual just process of jumping off the dock of getting, okay, now now I lean up, now my, my knees go, and once you're committed, you're committed, and gravity is going to take care of the problem of getting you into the lake. Um, 
but we're not, we tend not to be very, very process focused people. We tend to be very outcome focused people, which is one of the reasons that these things don't start. Um, but it's not the only reason. So, so, but before I go on, let me, let me also talk a little bit about the retrospective, actually, which is that afterwards, after something has happened, we again tend to focus on not did they do the right thing, but did they get the right outcome? And this is really dangerous. So in my book, I talk about, for example, hand washing in hospitals. This is one of the most basic things you have to do in a hospital, is that you have to wash your hands every time you, you touch a patient. In fact, you often have to wash a hand, your hands more than once when you're dealing with a patient. It's not n enough just to do it before you go in the room. Um, you have to, in between visits, if you've touched your eyes, you've touched your mouth, you need to wash your hands again before you put them on a patient especially if the patient is sick, which means that their immune system is challenged and it's vulnerable to new pathogens. Um, getting people to do this is one of the hardest tasks that hospitals face. Getting people to follow more broadly proper sanitary procedure, basically the biggest challenge that hospitals face. Why? Well, the problem is that one violation doesn't actually cause a problem. So you, you have people who don't wash their hands, you have people who maybe don't clean a central line as well as they should. It doesn't actually usually kill the patient. What you're dealing with is odds. So you're dealing with one time in a, a thousand or one time in 10,000 or whatever the number for the particular procedure you're doing is, then I'm gonna make this patient sick and hurt them. But that's not how our brains are really wired to deal with things, right? If you, if, you know, we're very much wired to think about things really instantly. We get a good outcome, we get a bad outcome. What did we do right before that happened? And so it's very hard to train people to stay sterile, to keep doing these things. And I cared for my mother at home after her appendix ruptured. And it really is difficult. And it's easy to see what the temptation is because if you screw something up, you, you're preparing to do an, an IV, you screw something up and you have to go and start all the way over. And so people tend to slack off on it. And you know, one of the things you see is that in surveys of healthcare providers, they insist that 100% of the time they wash their hands. Um, but when you actually watch them or you test their hands, you can see that they are definitely not doing it this often. Um, is that it's really easy to slip because you're not getting that feedback. And this is in fact how the medical liability system in our country works, is that you're more likely to get sued because something bad happened than you are to get sued because you made a bad mistake. The problem is that you know you, you can't get good outcomes just by looking at outcomes. In a situation like this where it's really complicated, where it's hard to predict what's going to happen, where patients vary, you know, one person checks into the hospital and dies, one person checks in the hospital and lives, even if the, the hospital did everything right, or even if they did everything wrong with both patients, you know, part of it is just variance of how healthy people are, their immune system, and, and what bug they had that day. Um, so you really, really need to focus on the outcome. You need to focus on, am I doing the right thing? The right thing is to take smart risks. The right thing is to be innovating because that's actually what, first of all, for personal success, if you want big time personal success, you have to be innovating, especially in this economy. Um, there is too much competition out there from other countries, from other people. You have to be out doing something that other people aren't doing because doing the same thing that you've always been doing is the surest route. Um, to, to getting yourself in a very bad place. Um, so instead of looking at right now, is my company doing okay, do we have the right processes? Am I innovating? Am I taking risks? Very hard to get people to do it though. Um, in order to do it, you need to think about lowering the costs of failure. This is the most fundamental thing. You need to do this on all sorts of levels. So first of all, personally. Personally, you have to lower the cost of failure for yourself before you think about doing it for everyone else because if you think about who is the most terrified of failure, it's us personally. Imagine, I want you to think about a time when you failed in some sort of particularly public way where other people saw you. It might have been at work, it might have been something embarrassing that happened in high school, whatever it was, think about that time and I bet you can feel the hairs on the back of your neck going up. I bet you can feel the blush creeping up towards your face. This is really, really deeply wired, you know, deep down into our psyche, we do not like to see other people see us fail. If you think about what the, the number one reported phobia is, it's public speaking, which is of course just the fear of failing in public. Um, so you need to develop, first of all, a mindset in yourself 
that, that cultivates the ability to take on failure, to take risks, and to not be terrified of what's going to happen if it goes, goes wrong. You, the good news is you can do this. And in fact, the most surprising thing for me in the course of writing this book was just how much better I got at failing. Not because I constructed any six simple steps to, to fail better or whatever, but simply because I was reading research on failure, finding out how important it is to learning and how important it is to economic and personal growth, just knowing the facts enabled me to be better at taking risks, more willing to take them, better able to pick myself up after some of them inevitably didn't work out. Um, but the second thing is, okay, so I've got a great mindset, but what about the people around me? Because we're not just, no man is an island, we're in companies, we are in networks of family and friends, and this matters an enormous amount too, is how do, how do the people around us treat failure? Do they think that taking risks is admirable? Do they, do they recognize that failure is part of the same process of success, as success? That success is not about avoiding failure, that the path to success is through failure. Um, and then the last thing you have to look at is the institutional environment, right? At the corporate level, what do we do when someone has a bad outcome? Um, but even bigger than that, at the legal level, at the, the financial level, what happens when we fail? This matters hugely, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, more later on. Right now, I just want to start with by, by talking about personally. Um, so there's a psychologist named Carol Dweck who studied people who were taking on challenges. So she would give them a test, it was, it was hard, and then they, she would offer them the opportunity to take a, a, an even harder test later and see how they did. Um, and she's looking at people, so a lot of the people, they don't want to take a harder test, they didn't like taking a hard test the first time, they'd rather do an easy challenge. But there's a small group of people who are like, yeah, give it, bring it on. And the interesting thing is that those are the people who, who learned the most over the course of this exercise. So she's sitting in her office, she's trying to figure out what's the difference between these two groups of people. And suddenly she has this eureka moment, she realizes that the people who are reluctant to take on challenges, those are the people who think of talent as a fixed quantity, and the, uh, the people who are willing to do it and enthusiastic about doing it and who are learning and growing have what she calls a growth mindset. They're the people who view challenges as a way to grow your talent set. So let's break down some of the, the key differences between having a, a fixed and a growth mindset. I'm not going to read the slides here, you guys can read them. Um, this is really key. Fixed mindset people think that failure, a challenge is like a dipstick, right? I dip it in, I see how talented I am, my talent is a fixed quantity that I've, I was born with, I've always had it, and am I any good or not? Well, if you think of a challenge that way, right? then challenges become terrifying <laughs> because at any moment you might find out that you don't have what it takes. Women are particularly prone to this for a lot of, I think, cultural reasons, possibly even some biological reasons, um, but it affects everyone and it shows up in really extraordinary ways. So there's a phenomenon called self-handicapping um, where, again, you give people a very hard test. In this case, it's a test that you actually can't get correct answers on. It's got these kind of vague, snowy answers that, that, uh, that don't actually enable someone to answer them in a verifiably correct way. And so you, you tell them, you then tell people that they did really well in the test. Now remember, they can't know how they did, how, how they did well because the questions are definitionally not actually answerable. And then you say, okay, we're going to give you an opportunity to repeat this. If you give them the choice between a performance enhancing drug and a performance inhibiting drug, neither of which are actually drugs because this is a, a well-run ethical research experiment, a lot of people will take the performance inhibiting drug. Why? Well, this is actually, if you think about it, a pretty common phenomenon. I mean, we all knew that kid in high school who blew off the SATs, maybe got drunk the night before, um, who didn't hand in homework, who didn't show up for tests. It's the idea, and, and where were they most prone to do this in subjects they found hard? Why? Because if you're not really trying, then you didn't really fail. Because if you, if you didn't put out 100% effort, well then you could still have what it takes, you just didn't bother to try this challenge. Growth mindset people understand that that is actually the biggest failure. That the most important thing is going out there and growing their ability by taking on challenges, 
and learning from them. And this is, by the way, empirically correct. This is how we learn. If you think about how we learn, it isn't about just, yes, there is talent, there is ability. I talked to Carol Dweck about this, and she said, no, I'm not saying that everyone, you know, could do exactly the same thing. To give you all an example, I'm six foot two, and I was done growing when I was 11, um, and they knew how tall I was going to be when I was like a year old. They measured, they did some measurement that told them that I was going to be really tall. Nonetheless, I decided when I was six that I wanted to be a gymnast. And when that didn't work out, I settled on my new career plan, which was, of course, to become a jockey. Um, and funnily enough, no one told me <laughs> that this was not a good idea until I was like 10 years old and almost done growing. And someone pointed out that I was already, I think, 5'8 or 5'10, and that probably I was not going to become a jockey. Um, nothing that I could have done was going to make me a jockey, right? Having a growth mindset is not going to fundamentally alter the fact that I'm way too tall to be to ride horses professionally in a race. However, um, even within ability, it matters a lot how you approach these challenges. Starting For a given level of starting ability, someone with a growth mindset is going to be able to go farther and faster than someone with a fixed mindset because they're going to use this fail fast to success process, the same one that works for entrepreneurs. They are going to learn and grow their talent pool by taking on stuff, not knowing that there are rules, not worrying about how they look, and getting the job done. Um, the, you know, the, 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 this is a quote from Carol Dweck. Wow, I suck at this. This is really fun. And the way I got this quote was she said, I confessed to her at the end of our interview, you know, I'm a fixed mindset person. Most writers are. We tend to, and as a result, we are inveterate procrastinators because we're always putting off the moment where we find out that we're not actually George Orwell. And I, so I confessed to her, I've got to tell you, I feel like a bit of a fraud. I'm sitting here. I'm a fixed mindset person. And she said, oh, me too. Um, but I learned and changed. And in the same way that I, I said, she said the same thing, which is that it wasn't like she gave herself exercises to do that made her more of a, a growth mindset person. It was knowing that this was true. It was understanding that failure is how you learn and that there are people out there who are better at this than I am. That was what she needed, not six exercises, just the fact, the ability to tell yourself, I'm not a failure, I'm someone who's failed, just like everyone else out, at, out there on the planet. Every great person that you think of, that you admire, has some really show-stopping, humiliating failures in their past. And so she said, you know, if I knew that I had changed when I heard myself saying, wow, I suck at this, this is really fun. But she also said, it took time. The good news, the reason I include this, is that the really good news is that you can change this. Is that actually, and she has a great book, Mindset, which I, I recommend to everyone, you can change how you approach failure, you can develop a growth mindset. Um, so I want to look at, at, at culturally um, why some people become entrepreneurs. To move on to, you know, to, to gross this up to culture. This, is a, th this graph is like a little bit complicated, so I'm going to show you what you're seeing, which is that here is the, the answer key, right? Why people don't start businesses. And this is data from the OECD. I've selected the, the, um, the countries because there's an even bigger list than what you saw there. Um, you know, I don't have enough skills, I don't have enough capital, I, the current economic uh, climate is not good. But I want you to look at this, this blue box right here, down the third from the bottom, risk of failure, right? I'm, I'm going to go back and look at this graph and look at the United States. So I've, I've circled that there. And you can see we really do have just culturally much less fear of failure. We have much less fear of everything, right? We're just much less worried about the downside of starting a business than most other countries. This is really powerful. This is one of, this is the reason that we have higher rates of entrepreneurship and more dynamic economy in a lot of ways is that we have people who just say, oh yeah, I'm sure it's all going to work out. I have a business idea, it's great, I've got, I'm going to get capital somehow, um, this is all going to be fine. And that, that thing, how do you, how do you develop that? Um, so one way that you develop it is by developing the kind of culture that you see in, uh, um, in Silicon Valley, right? Where failure is a plus. I was talking to a guy who was a CFO. He got laid off in 2000 and from a dot com, and he was—it was his first dot com—and he was really terrified about what was going to happen when he went back out on the job market. And what he found out was that people said, "Oh, this is great! You learned on someone else's dime. Um, I'm sure you got lots of valuable experiences." I talked to one entrepreneur who only hires people 
who've been at a failed business because he says they developed this kind of spidey sense about stuff that doesn't work. They've got a lot of valuable experience. Also, you know, um, they, they're looking for jobs, so it's it's a twofer. They tend to be available, but they also have huge, hugely valuable experience to his company that helps him from going wrong on the next thing. Um, this is this is quite unique when you look at other countries and how if you look at Silicon Valley, failure is a resume booster. If you go to a lot of European countries, it's the opposite: is that executives who have failed are treated as pariahs because obviously they did something wrong. But you go back to outcome versus process. This is the this is one of the key mistakes that we make. We make it for ourselves, and we make it when we look at other people, is that we assume that if they had a bad outcome, that must have been because they had a bad process. In this case, they did something stupid, their idea didn't work. But if you look at research on new ventures, it turns out that even companies that are well-funded, that have good VC backing, that have someone who has done this before, even those companies do not successfully, their odds of failure are higher than not. So, you know, even someone who clearly knows how to do this because they've done it before, even that person doesn't manage to do it. And that's because the economy is just fundamentally risky. It's complicated. You think about there are 300 million people out there doing something. You've never met most of them. You don't know what any of them are like. You don't know what products they want. Um, you can minimize your chances of failing, right? Do not go out, run out, and start try to start a, a line of meat-flavored ice cream palaces. You can say, okay, that's probably not going to work. I'm not going to start that business. But once you've got what you think is a pretty good idea, there's still a limit. You, the, the, ultimately, there's a limit to how much planning can tell you. Ultimately, you have to go out and try it and see if people want it. See if this location works for a business. See if you have what it takes to run a business, if you like running a business. All those things, the only way to find those things out is to do it. And the example I like to give is, um, you may have heard of a, a famous movie. Um, where, you know, huge water set, massively over budget, screening delays. Um, it was the biggest budget movie of its time. And by the time it came out, even the director said, I just, I already knew. I already knew it was going to be a hideous failure. The press was basically waiting to pounce on it. They're making fun of it. Um, they had lost, because they're filming in giant water, uh, a wave had come along and, and destroyed part of their set. Um, total disaster. Um, and the journalists, of course, are just gleeful. They are leaping on the fact that the studio allowed this thing to run tens of millions of dollars over budget, months over schedule, um, and that the script didn't really seem like a good idea to anyone, which just goes to show why journalists shouldn't be allowed to, uh, to, to <laughs> produce movies, because Titanic actually went on to be the biggest grossing movie of all time. And I tell that story, most people think I'm talking about Waterworld, which was another movie that came out just a couple years earlier. And in fact, that's what the journalists were thinking of. When you look at those two movies, you know, James Cameron thought his movie was going to be a bust when it came out. The fact is, no one knows anything. Why? Because it's hard to predict. You can, again, don't make a movie where it consists of two teenagers staring sullenly at each other for a couple of years. But once you've gotten on to that, af after that, that basic level, that threshold effect, um, you can't tell what's going to be a success because you don't know those 300 million people who you need to watch the movie. So I want to now talk a little bit about the institutional issues. So America is the bankruptcy capital of the world. Bankruptcy, I'm going to argue in a minute that this is actually the hidden success of America's uh, economy, is that people don't realize that bankruptcy, which everyone hates, is actually something that is making us stronger and more entrepreneurial. So a lot of people don't realize America actually has the most lax bankruptcy system on the planet. Uh, by a lot wide margin. Um, it's so lax that I was interviewing an expert on a completely different subject uh, in the course of writing this book, and he just randomly started making fun of America's bankruptcy system, and he said, so you just walk into a judge, and you say, I don't have any money, I'm not going to pay my debts, and the judge is like, okay, I guess, don't, and then you walk out. Uh, and that is a fairly accurate, slightly sarcastic description of how Chapter 7 consumer bankruptcy works in America. It's unique. This expert, by the way, was Scandinavian. So if you think that they're kinder and gentler on, they are kinder and gentler on people who are unemployed, but they're actually a lot harsher on, uh, on people who have started businesses and failed at them. The rest of the world thinks that what we do with bankruptcy is a little bit crazy. Why do we have so many bankrupts? One is literally just that our bankruptcy code is easier, um, is that 
we, nowhere else has Chapter 7, nowhere else has such ease of just walking into a court and saying, I can't pay, um, and either going on a payment plan or just shedding your debts and walking away from them. Uh, the second thing is that we have more entrepreneurship. Um, if you have more people starting businesses, you're going to have more people failing at businesses for the reasons we just discussed, which means you're going to have more people who have business debt they need to get rid of. And the third answer is just more household debt. Americans have access to basically the broadest and deepest capital market in the world, in the history of the world. It's very easy to borrow money, and bankruptcy lets you get out of debts that you've borrowed. If you you know, periodically, um, I listen to a lot of personal finance call-in shows as part of my job, and periodically you will see someone calling in who says, I've lost my job, I can't pay my bills, I need to declare bankruptcy, and they don't have any debt. And bankruptcy doesn't help you in that situation, right? Because bankruptcy is not going to give you the money to pay your rent or your light bill. What bankruptcy does is if you have debt that is draining your resources, it helps you get rid of it. And so the fact that we have more debt just means that bankruptcy is more valuable to Americans, which means you get more of it. So why do I say that this is such a boon to America? Um, well, there's a really interesting paper uh, that looks at this. Here's an interesting fact about American bankruptcy. It's in the Constitution that the federal government can, can establish a bankruptcy code. But while the bankruptcy code is federal, it was established in 1898, um, the exemptions vary by state. So we have a really interesting little national, natural experiment. In some states, you can shield all of the equity in your home, no matter how big it is which is why uh, OJ bought a big house in Florida after the Simpson, after uh, his ex-wife's family brought a civil suit verdict against him because he could shield that from them. Uh, that has, the ability to do that if you have a criminal uh, civil suit, but you, you can no longer go to Florida and buy a house to get around that, but you could at the time. Uh, we got rid of that in 2005. Um, but anyway, in Texas and Florida, for any normal debt, you can shield 100% of the, uh, unless you have a, a civil liability, you can shield 100% of the value of that house from creditors. Um, in other states, it's like $3,000 worth of home equity and the rest of it you have to sell the house and give it to your creditors. Um, so this is, gives us a really neat little natural experiment and what it turns out is that there is a significant relationship between how generous the bankruptcy exemptions are and how much entrepreneurship you get in this state. Why would that be? Well, first of all, you know, we talked about both outcome versus process. Perspective, now let's look at the outcome a little bit. Perspectively, if you're looking at starting a business and you think about starting a business and you think, but I could lose my house, it's a lot easier to go and start that business if you know, oh, my house is shielded. No matter what happens, the kids will have a place to live, you know, my wife won't have to move, whatever. Um, it's also retrospective, though. If you think about someone who has failed, keeping them out of the labor force, keeping them out of the entrepreneurial pool, is a huge loss of human capital to the rest of the economy, right? Um, but if someone has declared bankruptcy and they're having, if, or they've lost a business and they need to declare bankruptcy but they can't, or it's really difficult, then the, that person is going to be shut out. They can't go start a new business. It's hard for them to get another job with the, the frequency of credit checks these days. Um, I actually looked at one case in, in Denmark, which again, like uh, like other Scandinavian countries, has very tough bankruptcy laws. You, you can't declare bankruptcy unless your creditors agree. And so I talked to an entrepreneur who basically had a setback in 2001 and is, was still in 2012, struggling to pay off those debts and looking at losing his house and having to shutter his business. So this is someone who is a great photographer, who is a good business person, who's been operating a business you know, successfully in terms of just cash flow for 20 years. He had a setback in 2001 because of the recession, but the big problem was that he had to lay people off. And under uh, the laws of Denmark, when you lay people off, you have to give them giant severance payments. He had had to borrow the money. Um, to give those severance payments and after 10 years was still trying to pay that debt off. Um, if you look at what would have happened in America, that guy would have declared bankruptcy and might already be back on his feet employing people and so forth instead of struggling with a debt that when I talked to him was the same size as actually slightly larger than the debt that he had taken on more than a decade ago. Um, so. In both ways, you're going to see higher rates of entrepreneurship because people are freer to start businesses, and once they've had a business that has failed, they're freer to try again. Um, 
if you look at how new businesses are financed, we, we think of it as you go down to the bank, you tell them, you show them your business plan and the loan officer says, oh, that's a good plan, I'll give you a loan. And maybe it used to work that way, although when my grandfather started his business in 1940, his, both his, his father and his father-in-law had to pledge their farms and, and to, to get him a loan to do it. Um, you know, there are some businesses that are financed by venture capital or angel investment. There are some businesses that are financed by small business administration loans. But if you look at most small businesses, you're not looking at venture capital. You're looking at people financing things out of savings. You're looking at people financing things out of their home equity. And you not infrequently are looking at people financing things on MasterCard and Visa. Like more bridge loans have been given out by MasterCard and Visa than are probably to small business owners than have probably been given out uh, by any bank that you care to walk into. So bankruptcy is this incredibly powerful tool which we then decided to get rid of. Um, in 2005, we decided too many people were declaring bankruptcy, um, and so we passed a law called the the it's called uh, the Bankruptcy Abuse and Consumer Protection Act of uh, 2005. And it uh, made it so that you had to file more paperwork. There were all sorts of rules that just made it more difficult to file, especially by shoving higher earners into payment plans instead of allowing them Chapter 7, where you just get your debts cleared in exchange for surrendering whatever assets you have. Um, and when I talk to people, they would say, you know, look, we want to be more like Europe. We, we don't want to be like Memphis. I heard this over and over again from, from bankruptcy experts. And why Memphis? Well, take a look at a map. So here is what bankruptcy looks like in the United States between 2007 and 2010. And it kind of looks like there's some sort of terrible disease, right, that's spreading. Um, and if we had a patient zero, it would be Memphis. Memphis is the bankruptcy capital of the United States, which of course means it's the bankruptcy capital of the world. It has almost 1% of people in, in Memphis file bankruptcy every year. Um, often they're the same people, so it's not quite as bad as it sounds, but still extraordinarily high rate of, of bankruptcy. If this prevailed nationwide, then by the time that you got to the age of 70, more than half the people that you knew would have declared bankruptcy. Um, so I actually decided, you know what, I'm going to go to Memphis. I'm going to see how terrible this is. I want to see what it would look like if we actually had this giant moral hazard pro problem where everyone just starts declaring bankruptcy and shutting their debts. Um, and what I found was that Memphis was just not that bad. So think about it this way. What is the big risk of too much bankruptcy? Aside from the fact that we don't like people who cheat, uh, and we don't like to think that people are going out and borrowing money that they know they can't pay back and then just shedding it in bankruptcy. The big risk is that it's going to drive up the cost of borrowing for the rest of us. But, you know, in 2005, that was about the only problem that the United States did not have, was that it was just too hard to get access to a loan. Um, and that's what you see in bankruptcy in, in Memphis, is that loans are more expensive there, but they're not outrageously more expensive and no one can get access to capital, as witnessed by the fact that a lot of people are declaring bankruptcy. In fact, if loans were getting that hard to access, then people wouldn't be borrowing the money in the first place, um, and, uh, and then you wouldn't really have a bankruptcy problem because it wouldn't do you any good. Here's the other interesting thing, is that creditors actually like it. So I asked uh, Judge Jenny Latta, who's one of the bankruptcy judges there, What's the, you know, for example, judges aren't really enforcing a ban on second filings, which had been something that banks said was extremely important in the run-up to 2005. And I said, why aren't you enforcing this? And she said, I'm not enforcing because no one's complaining. That in fact, when creditors are, were faced with the ability to force people out of bankruptcy, they suddenly realized they didn't want to. They would rather have someone mailing a check to the trustee every month and them getting paid than to have to go down and track someone down and garnish their, wa their wages. In fact, bankruptcy can be even good creditors because it's an orderly process for giving people a fresh start, but also an orderly process for making sure that creditors get paid as much as is feasible. We've actually found one of the rarest things in, in America, which is a win-win policy. We can't, and this is the thing that people really struggle with, is that forgiveness is surprisingly cheap. Is that forgiving debt, forgiving failures, we, we worry that if we do that, people will abuse it. But even in Memphis, most people who could benefit from bankruptcy don't take it. Is that most people actually want to do the right thing, and most people won't abuse the system, even if it's possible to abuse it. But we have this economic puritanism. Uh, you know, H.L. Mencken defined uh, uh, puritanism as the, the haunting fear that someone somewhere was, ha was happy. 
And I define economic puritanism as the hunting fear that someone somewhere might be getting away with spending more money than they should. And you see it in bankruptcy, you see it in the financial crisis, you see it in arguments about social spending. And it's not that this is wrong. People do abuse all three of those systems. Um, but they don't abuse as much as you think. Um, we tend to think that people, oh, they must have known, right? They must have known with the financial crisis. They must have known with, with and yet when you talk to people who went into bankruptcy, they kind of did know. Talk to people in the housing crisis. They kind of knew that they couldn't really afford this house. They also saw other people doing it, and it was successful. We're especially prone to think this if someone has made a lot of money. <laughs> right? I can't tell you how many times I've heard the argument of the financial crisis is that bankers must have known that this was going to happen because, look, they're rich. And rich money does not buy clairvoyance unless you are shopping at the Psychic Friends Network. Um, in fact, when I interviewed them, they didn't know. They didn't see this coming. No one said to me, well, you know, if it all goes down, uh, it doesn't matter because we don't care. Um, the fact is that we're often stupider than we think because to go back to that example of Titanic, even James Cameron didn't know. The universe is complex. It is very, very easy in modern times. In a modern, complicated economy, it's very, very hard to see all of the potential repercussions of the actions that you're taking. Um, we just have a, a deep struggle with this. We have a deep struggle with not blaming people. And to think about why, I want you to look at this little graphic here. Um, what do you see? So probably what a lot of you see is a triangle superimposed on, on another triangle and some circles. Um, but in fact, this is some Pac-Man. If you actually look at how it's constructed, it's some Pac-Man and some triangles. Not everyone sees this, but a large number of people do. And in fact, they'll often even see a little shadow outlining the, uh, the, the lines of the triangle. Why do we see this? Because your visual system and your brain more generally are designed to say coincidences don't happen. If I see, it, if I see this, this shape cut out that looks like a perfect triangle, then the odds are that this is not just a coincidental arrangement of shapes. So as to look like a triangle, it must be an actual triangle. Um, and it can be very hard with a lot of these optical illusions to convince yourself that it's not what you're seeing, even when someone explains it to you. Um, your brain is a coincidence avoidance machine. It is also a causality machine. It sees causality everywhere. So to show you a little uh, example, if I can get the scrolling to work here. Um, this is, this is uh, an exercise done by a famous psychologist known as uh, Michotte. And what most people see when they, when they see this, how, how do you describe this? What, how most people will describe this little um, animation is that the one ball hit the other ball, and then that caused the other ball to move. Um, we say this even though, in fact, uh, an animator drew this, and there's no causation other than the fact that the animator drew it that way, right? But our brains are wired to see that. Our brains are wired to see that there are no coincidences, right? If the one ball hits the other one, and then the other ball moves after that, then that must be because the one ball caused the other ball to move. We see agency and causality everywhere. We have what, uh, what, what one researcher calls a hyperactive agency detection module, right? You have had this experience. You have seen, for example, um, so in the course of writing this book, for example, I spent five minutes trying to sneak up on my hat rack uh, because I was at the top of my stairs and the way that the shadows and the lights outside were going, it looked like a person and I became very afraid and I thought it was a burglar in our house. And so I spent a lot of time trying to sneak up on the hat, hat, hat rack. We do this all the time with everything. We see agency in systems. So if you look at an explanation of the financial crisis, for example, you can say that, oh, there were bad people and they did something bad. You can also say that regulators and homeowners and bankers were all getting the same bad signal from the market. So as house prices went up, regulators thought they were super smart because the economy was doing well, um, because housing is such a fundamental part of the economy. Bankers thought they were super smart because they would extend riskier loans and those loans would make money. So they thought that their credit assessment models were getting better. Homeowners thought that they had, as houses went up, homeowners thought that they had found a guaranteed way to make money while enjoying granite countertops. And everyone is getting the same bad signal from the market. And what they were missing was that because house prices hadn't fallen for so long, for example, what the bankers and regulators couldn't see 
was that people weren't defaulting on the loans, not because the loans had gotten less risky, but because as long as house prices are rising, you can always sell to refinance. You can always sell or refinance in order to get the money that you need. Um, and so they're missing something, but they can't see what they're missing. And into that rushes this instinct that we have for seeing agency. You see this if you've, you've ever seen faces in a cloud or a piece of toast. Your brain is primed to look for agents. It is primed to look from, if you see motion, you are more likely to think snake than shadow. Um, and this is actually pretty healthy, right? It doesn't do you much harm to mistake a rock for a saber-toothed tiger, but it probably does you a lot of harm to mistake a saber-toothed tiger for a rock. And so you are hyper-primed to see intention and motive and agency and individuals instead of big, inanimate, or complex systems that you can't control. So I'm going to close by saying, when, we, when it comes to failure, we look at the wrong things. So why does this matter? Why does it matter that we have the sense of to see agency because when the problem is in the system, we tend to try to fix the individuals instead of the system. We tend to try to send people to jail, right? How many times have you heard of the financial crisis, someone yelling that we didn't send someone to jail? When it comes to us and companies, when something goes wrong, we don't look at our internal procedures and what made it possible. Instead, we tend to try to find the guy who did it. When it comes to entrepreneurship or when it comes to any sort of failure in our own life, we tend to say, okay, well, I must have done something wrong, or someone else must have done something wrong, instead of saying, um, well, probably what happened was that there, it was complex, we gave it a good try, we did the best we could, and we have to move on and learn the lessons. Um, that blame makes, it, makes us much less productive at identifying problems, at fixing them, and at going on and taking new risks and innovating more. So I'm gonna close by saying, you know, we look at the wrong things. We look at outcomes instead of processes, we look at individuals instead of systems. We look at motives instead of actions. We look at the past instead of the future. The future is what matters the most, and it's what we need to be focused on um, if we want to have a successful life. So I'll close there and open up to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. That was, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, and we do have a question. Actually, it's, it's kind of a two-parter. So the, the question asked is, is, says, I care much less about the embarrassment of failure than the impact on family members depending on my providing. They need a basic level of safety beyond which I can then take on greater risk. So could you give us some insight onto that particular comment? Oh yeah, so I think the first thing I would say is that look, um, taking on a family is probably the biggest and best risk you'll ever take. Right, because people, things can go wrong with them, you care more about them than about anything else in your life. Um, and that to me personally at least, um, the family is what everything else is for. Right, that's the first and best risk that you take and then you structure everything else around that. And so you try to minimize, when you think about taking on risks, you're not just trying to bet the farm on a jackalope branch. You're trying to take smart risks, calculated risks that are about getting you somewhere really good. Right. Um, and so how do you minimize that downside? So one way, for example, that my husband and I did it was that when we bought a house, we, instead of buying as much as the bank would let us, we said, okay, what would happen if we both lost our jobs? Um, that's how much, it, and then had to take jobs that paid half as much. So let's buy that house, the house that we could afford if that happened. Now that meant a lot of trade-offs in terms of neighborhood and amenities and size of the house. But you know what, like our house is, is great. It's, we don't actually need more space. We might like more space because who wouldn't? But um, it, you can't really say there's anything in this house that we can't do because it, it just isn't up to snuff. Um, we made that choice so that we could maximize other things we wanted to do, like jobs and, and family stuff and, and so forth. The choice was you minimize that risk. And similarly, when you're thinking about entrepreneurship, you're not gonna minimize your family risk because your family is, for most people, what this is all for. So instead, how do you minimize the other risks in your life? Think about taking on a smaller mortgage that isn't as hard to pay. Um, think about what do my car loans look like? Think about minimizing all of the other obligations so that you always have the wherewithal to meet the big one. Now, if you're in a situation where your family is especially needy, you know, special needs parents and so forth, it is really hard to think about taking on entrepreneurship, and in that situation, it may not be right for you, right? Um, but in a lot of cases, you can minimize all the other stuff enough that you can still prioritize the family and prioritize the risk-taking that you want to do to get ahead in your career. Great. 
Perfect. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, a, another comment question was that you equate failure with exit in this talk when some exits are really not necessarily failures. Can you comment on that? Sure. That's absolutely true. As, as I think I said, you know, this is not a perfect proxy. It's just the proxy we have. Failure is hard to measure. Um, other studies have shown higher rates of failure. If you look at um, you know, the study from Harvard that looks at, at how which firms fail, found that even with really good backing and so forth, only about 30% uh, of, of firms succeeded. Um, the reason to look at exit, I think, is that it represents one of sorts of failures usually, not in all cases. Um, it represents just finding out that this wasn't what I wanted to do, right? And that's not a bad failure, right? Again, talking about how failure is about learning and growing, the only way to find out that this isn't what you want to do is to try it. And anyone who has tried to pursue a dream and then discovered that that wasn't for them has gained immensely valuable information and has, has lived a better life because of it. Um, because it's far better to know than to sort of be dreaming about it 20 years later and never to have tried. Um, but also, you know, it, it, it can be a health problem. It can also be that the business went under. Um, in all of those different ways, it's some sort of failure, but not a personal failure or even necessarily a business failure. It may just be that we got that information that, no, this is not what I should be doing right now. Okay, excellent. Um, and one final question came through. And simply, simply put, the question is, how can we coach ourselves to be more process-oriented versus outcome-oriented? You know, are, are there some steps you would suggest that people might, um, you know, might do to kind of get themselves moving along this path? Yes, and it is literally to think about the process. So I talk about this a lot with regards to entrepreneurship, where, uh, where, with regards to employment, rather, where it's incredibly dispiriting to look for a job, right? I mean, looking for a job is a process of going out and saying, would you like to reject me? And most people say, yes, I would love to reject you. Um, and it's really depressing, and so people avoid it. So how do you get over that? Well, I mean, salespeople face this every day. I'm sure that at least a couple people on this, on this webinar are, are in sales, and you know that doing those code calls and getting out there, it's not, there are a couple people I've had say, oh yeah, no, I don't mind it, but most sales guys I talk to are like, yeah, not my favorite part of the job. So how do you smile and dial? And it is literally about having, first of all, just developing a script. And it's not about having the perfect script. It's just about having a set of, of tools that I use when I call someone, right? You know, one guy I've talked to said, I always say, I'm told you're the guy to talk to about this. I'd really like to get your expertise. Whatever it is, it's having that little hook, that little tool, that little script that gets you going. Um, the second is literally just writing out a process, writing out I'm a, a set of concrete goals that aren't about getting the outcome, but that are about the process, and then checking them off. I call it giving yourself little wins, right? I made this number of phone calls today. I did these things that I had to do, um, and don't even think about if you start thinking about, I, I, have, I still haven't gotten a job, or I still haven't gotten a sale, or whatever it is, you're going to panic, and you make yourself less productive. So instead, focus on, I did these nine things today that I needed to do, which means that I did a good job today. Um, and the third is, is that you really need to reinforce that by talking to other people who are, who are in the same circumstance, whether it's trying to start a business, whether it's trying to become better in, in the job that they are. You need to go out with people who are taking those risks and reinforcing, sharing your stories, and remembering that, yes, this is part, this is the process. But it really starts with knowing that this is the process, and there's so much research out there showing this, that you cannot avoid failure. I mean, you can avoid the stupidest failures, but you can't avoid failure full stop, and that instead it's about, you know, focusing not on the risks you're taking, and not on the possibility that you're not, you know, a failure, but focusing on, okay, I know that this is a smart risk to take. I've done my homework and thought about it. These are the steps that I'm going to take, and I'm not going to think about the end right now. Excellent. Excellent. Megan, thank you so, so very much. This is uh, a wonderful, wonderful topic, an absolutely wonderful read, um, The Upside of Down, Why Failing Well is the Key to Success. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I thank you so very much uh, for your time today. Um, for the rest of you, please join us next month. In fact, our next author series, I'm, I'm proud to say, is 
on Wednesday, June 18th at 10 a.m. Central featuring John Jantz, uh, who's going to be coming to discuss his book, Duct Tape Selling, Think Like a Marketer, Sell Like a Superstar. Thanks to everyone for attending. And once again, Megan, thank you so very much. It's wonderful. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Great. Have a great day, all. Bye. Take care.